Thank you for listening to the Matt's Movie Reviews podcast, available on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and Stitcher. Also, please follow Matt's Movie Reviews on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Reddit, Instagram, and MeWe. And of course, be sure to visit mattsmoviereviews.net for the latest reviews, top 10 lists, and more. Now, on to the show. It's a game. A friendship game. If your friendships don't survive it, neither do you. Ten dollars. All we have to do is put our fingertips on it and each share our deepest, innermost desire. If it's a game, like, how do you win? We win by staying friends. College, job, family. We're already getting sucked into these things that we're supposed to do or be. I just hope that we can break out of that reality. I want this summer to last forever. for years. It's not some lost puppy. Maybe this is a whole part of it. Maybe we're just the only one dumb enough to believe it. We can fix this. We're still friends. Are we? This game, I'm over it. Listen. It was a test. If your friendships don't survive, neither do you. We can play again, right? You never should play that game. Uh-uh, no. Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I am your host, Matthew Pekovic, and this is episode number 474. Releasing November 11 on in theaters, in digital and video on demand, is The Friendship Game, a horror mystery that follows a group of lifelong friends who come across a strange object that tests their loyalties to each other with increasingly destructive consequences the deeper into the game they go. A mind-bending cerebral thriller that delves into themes of madness, loyalty, and regret. The Friendship Game also marks the latest film from director Scooter Corkle, who I'm glad to say joins me now on the podcast. Scooter, thank you so very much for your time today. Yeah, thank you for having me. This is fun. So this is really such an interesting movie. And, um, you know, looking into the making of it, when I find out that it's written by Daniel Orber, who is such an interesting writer in his own right of course he does stuff mm-hmm. in, in sci-fi with the oa and stuff but he also does stuff with historical fiction as well in his novels and such he says comes his ideas come from a lot of different places and the friendship game you know it's such an interesting kind of concept when it's all put kind of put together how did it how did this script kind of come to you though and what was it about the story that really kind of spoke to you as a as a film director that this was going to be the the second feature that you were going to jump into Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think w- with Damien too. I think his his uh, historical fiction is, I think it's alternate history. Mm-hmm. I think he's still kind of screwing with us, mm-hmm. <laughs> even even in his uh, his novel writing. So, um, yeah, I just I reached out to uh, a friend of mine, Dan Beckerman, who's one of our producers, um, and just asked him if he had anything weird um, that was looking for a director. And Dan's always working; he's just constantly busy. But uh, he did toss me Damien's uh, script, and it was anything I asked for. It was weird. <laughs> and I was very, very excited. Once I actually um, read the script, I kind of fell for it right away. I wasn't 100% sure what was going on, and it took me quite a while to actually decipher it. Um, and then, yeah, I met with uh, Damien Zach Koberg as well, who's the other uh, producer, another EP. And, yeah, we hit it off. It was good. They were gracious enough to let me do it. And Damien gave me the, um, gave me the reins. And I, I do really appreciate that. 
I think when it comes to movies like The Friendship Game, where you're dealing with you know themes that are kind of really kind of cerebral and and the tone mm-hmm. might be kind of like kind of like kind of mind altering, mind bending. A lot of times you got to kind of latch onto something that's really kind of intimate or something that's kind of human at the core of it. And mm-hmm. in the in the context of this film, of course, it has to do with friendship. And it kind of reminds me back when I was younger. You know, friends were everything to me. I yeah. got a ten year old son. His best friend moved away. Uh, to another state oh, and no. the impact it had on him I kind of forgot what it was like and it's just been so so tremendous the impact it's had on him and I, I, I you can't explain to him you know friends will come and go and such but he just does not get it at all and <laughs> yeah. as you get Anyone, older yeah. You, yeah as you get older friends are kind of replaced by family so the whole thing with this movie though is that kind of whole thing with friendship did you have to kind of like look into the own friendships in your own life to kind of like find that humanity, find that soul, find that intimacy to, to kind of like make sure that that was present in the core of the story to make sure that even though this film does go to different places, um, does do different things to make sure that humanity, that core, that intimacy is always there in present mm-hmm. for the viewer to, to watch it. Yeah, I think that I think you kind of nailed it there is that um, it is a cerebral cosmic horror, like it does kind of go to an alternate universe. Um we purposely built it to be quite obtuse where you don't really know exactly what is happening. Hmm. Um, and by grounding it in the relationships, grounding it first and foremost with Zuza as our lead character, but, but grounding it in these relationships, these friendships um, does mean that the horror actually is sparked from a place of character and it is sparked from the relationships themselves. So it's not just a creature sort of attacking folk. Hmm. It's their own demons. It is the monster within that is sort of sparking um, the horror. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, looking back to my memory as a as a kid um, in high school is when you are, you know, at the end of your years in high school, the the only people that actually truly understand you are your friends. Um, they are they are your lifeline where your parents just can't be. Um, where you're, you know, if you have a job at that point, your boss can't be, or even the school just can't be. Mm. Um, so when you are separating it, you know, the stakes feel like they're life and death, um, even though they're not, but the approach for this movie was, you know, what if the stakes are life and death? You know, what, what, what if the character's fears become the source of the horror? Um, and that, that seemed like a cool in to a horror movie. I'm always fascinated with the use of kind of like artifacts or fictional artifacts at a, as a center mm-hmm. of kind of like a sci-fi or horror. You know, you kind of go back to movies like Hellraiser, et cetera, where you got, they got like these kind of different things that kind of like these conduits that to like different kind of realms or different kind of experiences. In regards mm-hmm. to the artifact that you have in this movie, when you and 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 Damien are, are looking at the story, do you put a background to it? That's I mean, it's very kind of like. We don't know what's happening on the screen. There's no history to it. But as, as yourself, as storytellers, do you put a history to it? Do you treat an artifact as you would a character and put like a background story to it? Absolutely. I mean, I think you have to. It It, it is at the center of the film. Um, and Damien's always sort of thought of it as just a mechanism. You know, it's mm. it's not sentient. Um, it is it is literally just a mechanism that um, uses your deepest desires and gives you a game board. And it's not sort of in the you know, the really tropey game board where things are flying out of nowhere. It is, it comes from such a personal spot um, that it is you, your deepest desire coming out through you and you don't even notice it. Um, and that, that I think is what makes that object special. Um, and we, we've sort of considered it to be, you know, speaking on like the alternate universe or an multiverse. Um, it's that this object has always existed. And it's never existed. Um, it is as infinite as time is. Um, and it just shows up where it shows up for um, no real rhyme or reason. Um, and it's just something to interact with. And these kids just happened upon it. Um, sadly, they just happened upon um, this sort of eternal uh, mechanism. So that's sort of where it came from. The Matt's Movie Reviews podcast is brought to you by T Public. T Public is the world's largest marketplace for independent creators to sell their work on the highest quality merchandise. With over 1.2 million designs, T Public is sure to have something you will love. The Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast is brought to you by Amazon, the world's leading online store. Amazon is your first stop to buy a wide range of products at competitive prices with fast delivery times. 
Amazon is also a world-class entertainment hub that includes Prime Video, Audible, Twitch, Amazon Music, and more. Sign up with Amazon today and experience the best in online shopping and entertainment. Please support Matt's movie reviews on Patreon. Get access to exclusive content, request movie reviews and top 10 lists, and help support my work. Please click on the Patreon link in the description below. When it comes to the design of the artifact, considering kind of like the the implications it has on a kind of like a physiological, uh, uh, theological, you know, all of it put together. Mm-hmm. When you kind of design it and put it together, do you have you did you guys kind of go through all different types of designs and in, in, in or, or theories of the design of it? And, and what made you come to the point where that just kind of just kind of circular kind of object that we see in the movie was the one for for you guys? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think Damien's always kind of had a, a version of it written into the into the script that had these interlocking layers and it was built of different materials and all these sort of things. And I think we took that idea and had a long conversation with uh, Richard Simpson, who's our production designer, just around what that could mean. And to him, he was always sort of obsessed with ancient civilizations. Um, and I forget the the device that they found at the bottom of the ocean. Um but it, it it like predates when all of these clockworks and mechanisms um, actually existed, and it has all this clockwork and mechanism in it. And it was something that he was very fascinated about. So, uh, in the design, he sort of pitched me the idea that you know this thing has existed forever. So let's have each different layer have its own language um, that could be based on you know um, uh, Latin or America. Uh, not America, what is it? Uh, um, any, any ancient language, basically. Babylonian, whatever you want to do. Hmm. Um, and then create our own language based on it. So each interlocking layer has its own language um, that is associated to it. So as the layers sort of start to move, it's like it's speaking to itself. And then it, you know, not necessarily opens a portal, but at least creates um, what it does create, this multiverse. The use of color in this film is really interesting. And the two colors that really kind of jump out to me um, are blue and red. Um, mm-hmm. They use a lot throughout the film. And like when you're talking about kind of like the meaning of colors, you know, blue, I think a lot of people equate to, to sadness, red to to danger or, or to or to mm-hmm. some type of um uh, anger even. Is that kind of like the the the, the broad strokes that we're talking about here in regards to those colors in your movie, or did you want to use those colors to represent other things as well? I think color, we definitely leaned into color um, early on. And part and parcel of that design was that um, because we're kind of jumping around time-wise, we do like a cyclical format, we're all over the place, that color becomes um, sort of your map to where you are in the timeline. Um, That's where it starts. But then as the movie progresses, color then becomes um, an emotional cue, an emotional memory to a situation that happens. So, you know, when we start the film, you can keep coming back to the party and all those sort of things. So you do feel these colors and it reminds you where you came from. Um, but then by the end, you know, the color has a weight to it. It has an emotional weight to it. Um, and I don't even know necessarily if that was completely by design, but um, that's really kind of how, how it ended up, how it organically kind of developed for sure. The editing in this film is so, I think, incredibly important of course you know a lot of filmmakers tell me that the, the film film is made in the editing room and mm-hmm. i think in a lot of ways for the friendship game that is definitely you know something that's that pops out on the screen that kind of long linear structure that we see throughout the film and you talked before about how the, the kind of like different jumps between realities and, and time etc mm-hmm. when you put that stuff together do you kind of like have a like a good old kind of conspiracy ball with like uh, with drawstrings kind of linked to one thing to the other one to <laughs> figure it out um, or do you kind of like do you approach that kind of stuff in a different way? Is it in a script that that's, that those you see those jumps, or 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 like it's just really fascinating to me how you kind of piece all that together to make the complete mm-hmm. picture that we see uh, on the screen now? Yeah, I think my sort of understanding of filmmaking changed a little bit during the the making of this one. Um, you know, the the sort of moniker goes: you make a a, a movie three times, once in the script once in production and once in editing. Hmm. And I actually think you only really make a script in editing or a movie in editing and that the the script and production are actually just setting you up to edit the film and find the movie. Hmm. Um, So our script was more linear than the movie ended up becoming. 
Um, and then once we got into production, um, we shot we shot a lot of different pieces that didn't end up making the edit. And then we did some pickups and some reshoots to try and adjust the story a little bit more to make the cyclical format work, um, which ended up being the more powerful version. Because even earlier to your point is like, there's so much going on. There's so much weirdness going on. And because it is specifically obtuse, uh, you kind of need what you were talking about was the, you know, that, that sort of base um, character arc, that emotional arc to really grasp onto so you don't get lost. And then anything around it um, can kind of, you know, dictate your experience of it. But as long as you have that one emotional core, um, you're going to be all right. So we really found that in editing. Um, and we had, yeah, we definitely had cards. We put all the cards down and we looked at it and we moved cards around and did that kind of stuff. Um, and then eventually uh, Matt Lyon, one of our editors, Tony, Tony Joe did the first half and then Matt jumped in at the end and he just built out the movie with slugs. So it's like, mm. this is what scenes need to be reshot. Here's where they go. Him and I had long conversations on that. Um, and then we really kind of discovered the movie in a really cool way. So yeah, I, th I think you only really make the movie in editing and you, you set yourself up with writing and production. That's my, currently, that's my, my feeling. We'll see what happens in the third one. <laughs> Have you had a chance to watch this film with other people, like um, audiences, et cetera? And what type of reactions have you seen to the film in regards to that kind of uh, community reaction to a film like this? Because I imagine a movie like this, not only uh, viscerally does it have an impact, but also kind of like the, uh, the, the crux of its emotion as well. I think um, it really does have an impact as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did test screenings. So we did, we did do test screenings throughout the process. Um, and those were very helpful uh, to kind of get to the final cut. I have not seen the final cut with everybody yet. Mm. Um, so I'm really, really looking forward to that is actually being in a theater um, and watching that happen. I think that's going to be super fun. Um, and you do, you know, even with my first movie, like when you sit with an audience and you watch it, it's as though you're watching it for the very first time because for whatever reason, when everybody's watching one screen together, the vibe changes, your mood changes, your reaction to it changes. I find myself like laughing or being shocked by stuff that I shot, you know? Um, so it is, I think audience is super important. I'm really, really looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, I'm really looking forward for people to watch it as well. And that's November 11 in theaters on digital and video on demand, The Friendship Game. I really recommend people check this film out. It's a really film that really, you know, just took me for a ride. You really did scoot and I think you did a really great job here. And I thank you so very much for your time today. Congratulations on the movie and uh, best of luck with the film's release. It's uh, it's really awesome, man. Yeah, I appreciate that. I really, really do. Thanks for having me. Thank you for watching the Matt's Movie Reviews channel. Please subscribe for more reviews, podcast interviews, and exclusive content. Also, if you would like to request a review and support my work, please join my Patreon via the link in the description below.